Wait, 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 It says it's live streaming at the top of my screen. Okay, we go live then. Okay, all right, guys. So welcome to episode three of our series. And this is the episode in which we deal with microeconomics. We're sorry that we were slightly delayed. We had a couple of technical issues, but everything should be working fine now. Um, so as you guys will be aware, if you've listened to the other episodes on this series, this is a series where we're dealing with the repercussions of COVID-19 delving into particular areas and how that may affect you depending on the particular subjects that we're focusing on in each episode. So today we have split our economy episode into two and we are focusing on aspects that will affect the self-employed, uh, people who are employees but maybe don't have quite a clear picture as to what exactly their rights are and people who own small businesses. And to that end we have gathered a quite quite strong panel, I think, for this episode um, of people who will bring their expertise and hopefully have some colourful conversations as always. So I will allow them to introduce themselves. And first up, dealing with them in alphabetical order, we have Afia Titus, who you may remember from series one. Hi everyone, yep, I am Afia. I run Lime Hut, which is a Caribbean street food brand, and I'm also co-founder of Coco Financial, uh, which is a business accounting and finance consultancy uh, aimed at millennials, but um, we look after everyone as well. So I'm um, looking forward to get diving in and chatting to you all about topics. Great, and next up we have Alex Freed. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Alex Freed. I'm a chartered accountant. I am director of Philip Freed & Co, a small firm of accountants and tax advisors. And um, I advise personally, um, mainly among the legal industry. So a couple hundred barristers, chambers and other legal professionals. Great. And our next panelist is Rad Kohanzad. Yeah, uh, I'm a, a barrister specialising in em employment and discrimination law, uh, so I might speak to Alex afterwards, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's my specialty. I do a few other bits and bobs, but that's primarily what I do. Great. And next up, we have Timmy Dorgu. Hi, my name's Timmy. I'm a uh, small business owner. I have a diamonds business in Hatton Garden and also a social media management business and have previously worked at businesses large and small, such as L'Oreal, uh, so bring a bit of a varied picture. And last, but by no means least, we have Ore Nzekwe. Hi guys, I'm Ore. I'm a strategy and management consultant specializing in financial services, uh, predominantly transformation and change programs. Um, and for the last six years, I've been working as an independent contractor um, through a limited company. So hopefully I'll be able to give that kind of perspective. Brilliant. And as always, your co-hosts are me, I'm OJ or Abby, depending on what mood I'm in. <laughs> and, and I'm Io. Hi, everyone again. Hello. So we are going to kick off by talking about what's happening with employees. Um, and in particular, uh, if I could just go over to Rad to sort of outline for us what the provisions are that the government has laid out for people who are in employment or were in employment and may need some financial assistance. So the government have brought in a, brought in a scheme called the um, Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme. Uh, and um, it's a scheme for employers. And when you look through the guidance, that's one of the things which is really clear from it is it keeps on talking about employers. There's virtually no mention. Oh, there, there, I mean, there is mention of employees, but it continually talks about employers. And I'll just give you some examples. Employers can use a, a portal to claim up to 80% uh, of furloughed employees' usual monthly wages up to two and a half thousand pounds a month. So it introduces this new idea of a furloughed employee. What's a furloughed employee? That's a, an employee who's been sent home, usually because there's not enough work. I say usually in this case, because there's not enough work. And it's a bit like being laid off, except that and there are already provisions about laying off in all of the statutes. And so they couldn't use the phrase laying off, uh, laid off employees. So they had to borrow a term used in America, which is furloughed. And that's why they've used a word which um, I don't think uh, many of us have ever heard before. 
So the idea is, it's a scheme for employers, and what they do is they apply under the scheme uh, for their furloughed employees, uh, employees they've laid off, and then they can. The government will then pay the employer eighty percent of the employee's wages up to a maximum of two and a half thousand pounds, uh, and they'll pay their national insurance on top of that. So that's two and a half grand before tax. So you as an employee are dependent on your employer making that application, getting that money through and then providing it to you. So if you're an employee, you can't, you're not the person who applies directly to the government to get that money. Exactly. And it's a bit, it can be a bit frustrating because if your employer's uh, dilly dallying or um, uh, isn't necessarily that comfortable with it or for whatever reason they're not doing it, there's nothing you, there's, well, I don't say there's nothing you can do, but there's not too much you can do about the scheme because it's a scheme for employers. The employers right. have got to do the running, employers have got to make the application, they've got to use a portal, which is going to be set up soon, and, and make the application through the portal. And so you said, for example, the, that the portal's going to be set up soon. So as far as we're aware, that portal's actually not been set up yet. And so people aren't receiving the furloughed payments quite yet. That's right. So I think what's anticipated, I think it's for, just fortunate for the government, is that it will be by the end of the month. And so what's anticipated is by the time that it comes to kind of the April payroll, the scheme will be set up and the employers will be able to either, if they've made a payment, then get a reimbursement from government, Mm -hmm. or if they're imminently about to make a payment through payroll, they can also make an application. It's not clear what happens if they don't have enough money, if the employer doesn't have enough money. Yeah. Um, uh, whether they'll be able to get the money first from the scheme or not. And I don't know the answer to that question. The guidance uh, intimates that they should be able to get the money first, but it's not 100% clear on the matter. So you would hope and um, that they should be able to get the money first. Yeah, and it's interesting what you were saying there about it really being dependent on the organisation of the employer. So first of all, whether or not they have the money in place. Secondly, whether they are organised enough to make the application. And so what you do as an employee, if you don't have access to that money. So asking you from the sort of more of a barristerial aspect of things, if you are of the view that your employer is kind of just waiting around, not really doing much, what sort of rights do you have to complain about what's happening or to try to access any money? It's it's a really difficult situation. I've been uh, advising uh, a bus driver recently and he's he's been laid off. Uh, He wasn't really told uh, he was furloughed, laid off, whether he was redundant, whatever the score was, he was sent home. Mm. His boss said, I've got no work for you, sorry. Um, Off you go. And... The starting point, actually, for all employment situations is the employment contract. And most employers are not going to have the right to send an employee home without pay because it's a contract. And the idea of a contract is the employee makes themselves available for work. And when they make themselves available, they get paid, whether whether they do any work or not. And so um, if an employer sends you home without a right to send you home, they're in breach of contract. And so this employer, many employers will be who already have been in breach of contract. Um, but another option, and what's happened, and uh, I've spoken to an employer in this case, who's just gone through wholesale redundancies. Um, now, yeah. the good thing about the furlough scheme is that it allows uh, the employer to re-engage the employee, to re-employ them, and then furlough them. So if you've been made redundant, let's say a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, What you'll be able to do is your employer, if they're up for it, not every employer will do it, is they can re-employ you and then follow you and then you'll get 80% of your your pay. And it's backdated, isn't it, from what I understand from Rishi's announcement. I say Rishi like he's my friend, but he's my favourite politician at the moment. But um, (laughs) it is backdated so that there shouldn't be a gap in terms of your last paycheck and when the furloughed payments start or the starting date for the furloughed. I mean, yeah. it, there will be a gap in practice because there'll be a gap from um, there'll be a, there may well be a lag between your payment. But um, just speaking to a, a hotel owner recently, everybody got paid at the end of March and he'd already made a whole group of people redundant, but still paid everybody right. up until the end of March. Then the government scheme has, has been announced in, after his redundancies. And he's, um, I think, He's going to then re-employ everybody and then furlough them. So all the people he dismissed, he'll re-employ and then furlough. And okay. so then they should 
it should be seamless so that at the end of April, they then get paid out, albeit it's a maximum, the government's only guaranteeing 80% of their salary up to two and a half thousand pounds. So, um, yeah, and there's no guarantee that your employer will pay you more than that. Yeah, something that came up in terms of discussions that I've had, um, because I actually put up on my Instagram story a few um, days ago to ask people if they had any concerns around this area. Um, and some of the discussions which have come up as people who are on zero hours contract. So obviously what you raised before was that the, the starting position is to look at the employment contract. But if your employment contract says that they can give you zero hours and pay you nothing, um, or if you're very flexible in terms of what you bring in, then what's the position for you? So on the face of it, you don't have that contractual protection to stop you from being sent home without any money. Yeah, so you're right that they don't have the contractual protection, so the employer mm -hmm. can send them home. But the scheme, uh, fortunately, it, and I think it's probably a matter of convenience more than a matter of ideology, is focused on PAYE. So if the person was paid through PAYE, which most zero hours contractors will be, uh, most zero hours empl employees will be, then they're entitled to be furloughed by the employer. And I just, the guidance says in, in, in very clear terms, furloughed employees must have been on the PAYE payroll on the 28th of February, 2020, and can be on any type of contract, including full-time, part-time, employees on agency contracts and employees on flexible or zero hours contracts. And so in some senses, at least from a, although your employer, if you're on a zero hours contract, your employer can send you home and give you no work, they can furlough you. And if they furlough you, what um, we need, what the employer's got to do, what HMRC has got to do is look at what you're getting paid on um, PAYE and you'll get your furloughed wages, the equivalent to what you're earning through PAYE. That's great. So that can cover, so if it's what you're earning through PAYE, so say you're somebody who works in hospitality, because I think that's one of the yeah. industries which has been hit the hardest. Yeah. If you're receiving your PAYE, if you're receiving your normal salary, and then on top of that, you're, you also receive tips or anything like that, you're saying that if that comes through, say your restaurant pays you your tips through your salary PAYE system, that should be protected and, and given to you through the furlough scheme up to the two and a half thousand pounds? Uh, no. So no. I don't know, you know, yeah. So um, broadly speaking, but there's a, a, a part of the guidance which makes clear that it's not um, bonuses uh, and, um, and extra fees. I'm just, uh, give me one second if I can find it. Um, yeah, so, so it says that it won't include, so the two and a half thousand pounds won't include fees, commission and bonuses. Now, I don't know whether tips would in, uh, be included included in that, and I don't think I can answer that question. Um, yeah. Uh, but the, the point is, I think, and what the, what the scheme seems to be focused on is your basic pay. Okay. Uh, and so um, I don't think, um, it's not a bonus, uh, it's not a commission, right? Because commission is usually something which works on a sale. It could, maybe be a fee but i don't know is the answer and so well, just just to interject there I'd, I'd probably add that during this period a lot of those especially hospitality businesses are going to be closed so there won't really yeah. be tips coming in um so, so i do imagine that it is being treated as a commission but one that probably isn't incoming at all right now and so won't need to be split yeah i suppose i suppose the question um which, which um arises is if you let's say for example your basic pay was 1200 pounds a month but including tips, you got seventeen hundred pounds a month. Yeah. When you're furloughed, are you entitled to eighty percent of twelve hundred or eighty percent of seventeen hundred? Exactly. And I don't know. And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the question, because also at the moment, what we've got is guidance. We don't have legislation, and so you've got to wait till the legislation comes in until uh, until we know. But fees, commission, and bonuses. Um, I would think that 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 tips don't seem like they're in, uh, uh, excluded from the language of fees, commission and bonuses, but we'll have to wait and see what the legislation says. And part of the problem with these sorts of things is the language of like pay and holiday pay and all those sorts of things are hugely complex uh, and they use sorts of words which none of us have got a clue what they mean. And you need to be a tax lawyer, which is a strange breed of lawyer to, um, <laughs> to, to understand. L luckily, there's none on the call, but there is an accountant. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so we have to we have to wait and see uh, what what the legislation says. But at the moment, 
it looks like it's focused on basic pay. Okay, and so that's, that's that's an interesting aspect for us to look out for when we go into the coronavirus bill to see what coverage, if any, there is there in relation to those particular areas. I think I interrupted you, Raz, you were about to say something else. Yeah, the, the other thing is, um, I, I, from reading the guidance, is it looks like you could get paid less than a minimum wage as well. So yeah. if your, um, uh, your basic pay, 80% um, of your basic pay takes you under the minimum wage, you're going to get paid less than a minimum wage, um, which is obviously really problematic for huge swathes of society. Yeah. Um, so some interesting food for thought there and we so that's the employed aspect of things if we move over to Alex um, dealing with self-employed income support could you first of all just outline for us what provisions are that the government has made available because we know that there was a period of time when a lot of people who are self-employed were quite disappointed by the announcements which were made by the government which didn't really seem to cater to them at all and recently that has been updated yeah, um, so I think you're completely right. The first announcements were um, pretty un inappropriate for, for, for self-employed um, businesses. So, so in, in the second round of announcements, so um, Rishi Sunak's conference um, last week, he announced a self-employment income support scheme. Um, there, there, there are some things that are more general um, that affect self-employed people, like the um, interruption loans but I think I'll just talk about the self-employment income support scheme now mm -hmm. it's a taxable grant um, and and the the amounts are are similar to the um, to the to, to the coronavirus um, job retention scheme so it's 80 percent of your trading profits capped at two and a half thousand for three months I think there's some debate at the moment as to how long the scheme will last I think the Chancellor will will extend it if he if, if, he, if he needs to but at the moment we're thinking three months so the total available grant is seven and a half thousand there are there are various conditions the two headline ones are your trading profits must be below fifty thousand and that's either in tax year 18 19 or by using an average of the last three years and if you don't have three years then we use whatever we've got and you must have started self-employment prior to 5th of April 19. So um, the chance is very clear about this. You've got to be known to HMRC. You've got to be in the system. And then you also have to have been disrupted by the coronavirus. Um, that's probably not going to be tremendously difficult for many people to prove. Um, and you must, you must have traded in tax year 1920, and it must be the intention to trade after 5th of April 2020. Unlike the job retention scheme, um, where workers are furloughed, you can continue to trade under, under the self-employment income support scheme. Um, what's important to note is you, you need to derive more than half of your overall income from self-employment. So um, th there are some people who uh, will be doing part-time self-employment on the top of other 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 income like like your salary like pension income that won't qualify um how will it work we don't we, we we don't really know how it will work the idea is hmrc will contact the people who they think uh qualify and they will be invited to fill out a form and at some point in june hmrc will make a direct bank transfer to these people i should say that although it's the self-employment income support scheme, it also includes uh, members of partnerships who for tax purposes are basically treated like um, collections of sole traders. But it does not, it definitely does not include um, owner managed companies or company directors uh, or, 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 or people like landlords. It, it, it's for people who are trading in a self-employed capacity. We think there's somewhere around 5 million self-employed businesses in the country um, and, and, and it's quite a diverse range of people so so you know you, you go from gig economy workers who often are quite poorly paid uh, certainly on a per hour basis right the way up to, to, to partners of law firms and other sort of entrepreneurial people um, and I so think no, just I think, to, oh sorry <laughs> we're just going to jump in and ask you because we had 
a listener question I think which ties into that so you mentioned that one of the requirements is that at least 50% of your income comes from a self-employed basis so one of our listeners has asked by Instagram um, what do you apply for if you're self-employed for two jobs you're employed by one company and you're a furloughed worker but you won't receive enough to live on and then you work at, for an agency as a TA in schools so you've got a mixture of self-employed and employed income yeah, I, th I think um, it's, imp it's important to note, um, I think as Rad said, the guidance is incredibly sparse right now. So um, the guidance that we've got is A, probably being developed as we go, and, and, and B, you know, this isn't legislation right now. What I would say to that um, is you would have to look at the self-employment income support scheme on its own merits. So you go through the, 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 the same test that I just outlined. So if your self-employed income represents more than 50% of your total income and you either look at 18, 19 or you average out over the last three years, um, then, 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 then you are, you are in theory, you are eligible for the self-employment income support scheme. You may also be eligible for the job retention scheme um, so as far as I understand it you can be furloughed from one job and then continue to work for other people um, you obviously can't work for the employer that has furloughed you but there's nothing to stop you from being furloughed and then go and do self-employment um, outside of that um, Okay, so Aurea has just pointed out that it's just after eight o'clock and this is a bit, it's a bit, a bit unusual because we're obviously live streaming this so anyone who's listening back to this might find this quite strange but we're going to pause in terms of discussion and we're going to do a clap and applause because there is an eight o'clock clap and applause now for care workers and others who are frontline workers and obviously putting a lot of um, personal sacrifice uh, forward in order to maintain everybody else's safety country going so can everyone unmute their mics and join in as we clap and applause for those people who are working on the front line Woo! So I can hear my neighbours outside doing it and they might be <laughs> antisocial by not popping outside to join in you can see my parents out the window <laughs> <laughs> there we go so we are acknowledging them and um Obviously, as we outlined in our episode, our health and social care episode, there's a lot of personal sacrifice which is uh, going on in terms of people who are working in those areas. And I think we can all say that we're extremely grateful for the work that's being done by them. Um, all right, so sorry, Alex, to have interrupted you um, midstream. So you were explaining that people who are furloughed, there's nothing on the face of it to prevent them from uh, working in employment elsewhere or even uh, working as self-employed individuals. And the other parameters that you were highlighting for the self-employed scheme was that your profit needs to be 50,000 or less. So if you earn 50 and, and one pound, if your profit is 50,000 one pound, what then happens? Does that just mean that you're ineligible for the with the scheme like a see a fear and nodding as 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 far as we know from the guidance that's been written that is the, that is the position so it's a hard cliff edge as soon yeah. as you exceed fifty thousand, you are not entitled to 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 anything from the self-employment income support scheme no, normally with tax policy there's often a tapering that happens uh so for example with with with, with child benefit or losing a personal allowance this is this is this is a quite a a, a rigid condition um and and I think in general, so the Chancellor said, I mean, there are clear winners and losers out of mm -hmm. this. So th th there, are, there are lots of people who, who, who are going to benefit and there are lots of people who clearly are not going to benefit. There are lots of gray areas. And I think because of the, the high level of conditionality that the Chancellor has imposed, you, you are left with a couple of distortionary um, examples. So, so you're completely right. The difference between having profits of 49,000 and 51,000 is that the former gets 7,500 and the latter gets nothing. And you can take it even further. So, so you could have a household of two self-employed people, both in receipt of 49,000 trading profits, total 98,000. They, they will get a grant together of 15,000, whereas yeah. a household of one earner on 51,000 receives nothing. And, and actually, 
you know, having having the requirement to have more than 50% of your, your total income self-employed, um, it, it can be quite generous. So if, again, if you're on 49,000 and you have 20,000 of rental income or pension income, well, you're clearly much better off than somebody who has 51,000. So the, 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 the chancellor uh, in his, in his uh, when he was, when he was uh, put these sort of questions to him in his announcement, he said, um, he wasn't going to make perfect the enemy of good. And I think he's been successful in, 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 in that objective. Um, there's, there's clearly a lot of people that will benefit. So um, if you are qualifying for, 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 the, for the scheme, um, this is going to be cash in their, in their hands when they're unable to work. And I think, that, I think the priority must be to make sure that households and business survive in this position. Um, yeah. The problem is, there's a couple of problems in my, in my mind, and um, um, the, the, the first one, and it, you know, the first one is actually an operational problem. So can vulnerable self-employed individuals afford to wait for a backdated payment in June? Um, yeah. I, 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 I suspect that um, we'll see a lot of them, a lot of those people um, struggle to, 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 to wait for that backdated payment. Um, one of the lessons that, I think here should be learned is that we probably should have a better digital interface with taxpayers. So I don't, it'd be quite unfair to, to blame HMRC for not being prepared for this. But actually, I think that the, the way that we all communicate with HMRC, and I, I see it on the front line, it's, 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 it's pretty poor. And I think having some sort of um, digital interface with, with taxpayers and HMRC makes a lot of sense in this, in, uh, certainly when we're going through this. Um, and, and again, I, I don't really want to get into the kind of, I don't really want to litigate the argument of, uh, if you have more than 50,000, are you therefore rich? I mean, clearly from a public policy perspective, we don't really want the government to be giving money to, to rich people who can weather the storm. Um, and, and the chancellor said that this is going to affect 95% of people are going to qualify for this scheme and the 5% that won't will be um, have an average profit of 200,000. I haven't reconciled those figures. I'm not certain that that's, that's, um, that's a particularly helpful way to look at it um, because I think, I think when you use an average for these 5% of people, you're probably getting an enormous skewing from the from the very high earners. So, yeah. um, you know, if I put a um, hundred people in a room and one of them is Bill Gates, um, everyone's average income is going to be enormous, but it doesn't tell you about everyone that's not Bill Gates. Um, yeah. And clearly, fifty thousand is a threshold. It, it 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 will mean different things for different people. So so fifty thousand pounds <coughs> of profit in London is clearly going to go a lot. Of, uh, going to go less far than fifty thousand pounds in other parts of the country, um, but it, it, I, 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 I think that probably if it were if it and it's all, always incredibly easy to to, to pick holes in, in in what's happening and and to and to sort of um, try and design a system in abstract. I think there are in, there are enormous operational issues here. If it were me, I think it's. I, I think we're probably a tapered system where you don't have this um, hard cliff edge above 50,000. And I think I'd probably be a bit more, um, I, I, I would probably give more people the grant and then worry about taxing it back later. We've got Rad with his hang up, hand up. Yeah, um, I suppose this isn't an employment law intervention, but I think the reason why they've gone for the cliff edge is Although fairness um, would probably dictate we should have a taper, I think it's much harder to police uh, and much harder for um, to, you know from a taxing perspective. And so you know that's why they tend to kind of go for these um, uh, very kind of like um, black and white cliff edge uh, um, lines because it makes it easier for them to kind of to to to, to um, legislate for. But, that was what Rishi Thanks. said in the announcement. But I, what I find quite interesting about it, and I should say, Alex is actually my accountant, which is why. <laughs> um, um, so something that Alex and I do, for example, is Alex now does my BAT. 
and we are also we've also moved over to digital uh, self-assessment forms so that actually means that every three months or so HMRC through the VAT section actually has quite an, a clear idea of what I'm earning, what I'm receiving each quarter. And I, I did find it a little bit strange when they said that that was the reason, because if they allowed for circumstances where people have regularly been updating HMRC quarterly about their income, and it's quite clear that they are literally about to earn like 51,000 or so on, there could have been room, I, I think, for them to have been a little bit more flexible. Um, but also, Alex, what you're saying, if only they'd brought in the making tax digital earlier, as you've been pushing for all these years, then the basis would have been much clearer and much smoother to bring in a, a tapered regime. But I think Rad, you're right. I think it is a practical decision that they seem to have made. To Can we go back to Rad, actually? Can we go yeah. back to Rad? Because there's a question, question. Um, from YouTube um, from someone on the chat. It says, um, I got my fellow contract and today it stated that I wasn't allowed to work for someone else. Is that legal? Uh, good question. What you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to uh, work for your employer. Um, this is something I can find the guidance. I've actually closed the guidance down. Um, uh, but it specifically does cover uh, the issue. One second. Um, so one thing you're not allowed to do is do any work for your employer. It does uh, allow you to... Um, Give me one moment. Can can we come back to me on that? Because I'll find it in the yeah. guidance and see what it sure. is. All right. Sure. Great. Well, while Rad is looking that up, the next area that we had for discussion was the small business support scheme, which I think Afia, you're going to be taking the lead on. So could you start uh, by outlining the provisions that the government has made available for small businesses? Um, and by small businesses, um, I presume you mean non-self-employed, i.e. limited companies. Yeah. Yeah, um, so to be perfectly honest, I think this is where there still seem to be some gaps and um, a lot of people have maybe fallen through those gaps um, in that there's not a huge amount of very clear guidance, at least, um, of sort of easy support to access for those running limited companies. Um, that said, if the limited company you run um, is run out of a physical property, like a, a retail shop, um, a coffee shop, something like that, then there is a very welcomed uh, business rates holiday um, that actually ties back to our first episode we did um, on the, the first manifesto read where we were sort of discussing what each of the parties were going to address with business rates. I think business rates has been long overdue a review and perhaps as a good thing, this might sort of uh, be the catalyst to really look into that even further. Um, with uh, help in terms of sort of cash flow, um, if you are expecting to pay your payment on account in July 2020, um, that won't need to be paid until January 2021. Um, so again, that's not a grant, it's not as generous as uh, some of the other schemes, but it is certainly helping with cash flow and when no income is coming in, if you've been affected by COVID-19, any breather um, in terms of helping with cash flow is obviously always welcomed. Um, and so that helps, doesn't it, if it ties in with what um, Alex was discussing earlier. If you're self-employed and you're earning over the 50000 but you hopefully have some money set aside to pay your tax bill, um, so you would, your next tax payment would be in July, and yeah. then your, the one after that would be in January. And, and what HMRC has basically said is that you can defer or you can wait to pay your July payment until January. Please step in if I'm... So yeah, that is, no, that is correct. And so from a cash flow perspective, if you're in receipt of over £50,000 profit, you at least know that you don't have that tax bill coming up imminently to be paid in July. Yeah, but it correct. still will need to be paid at some point. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Okay. Um, uh, another option uh, that is available, this is not just for limited companies, but for everyone, um, is the Sybil, so the COVID interruption business loan. Um, this obviously is taking on additional debt. This will not necessarily be appropriate for everybody, uh, but because it's a very favorable rate, uh, it's going to be free interest for 12 months. Um, I don't know, does anybody know what they've set it at for after the 12 months? I've not heard an official update on that. I think that's still in review. Um, Alex, do you know at all? My, my, my understanding is that um, the 
um, so so the, the 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 business interruption loans are run by the private sector and guaranteed by the government. My understanding was that the private sector was not doing a very good job of running this scheme, and we should expect some um, changes to the way it's going to work. Um, in the next few days, I, I, I don't know what happens to the interest rates yeah. afterwards. But I, I know when I certainly when I spoke to um, Nat West on behalf of some clients, um, it, it, it was it was not as easy as one would have liked to yeah. uh, get the finance. I think this is a time where the banks really need to pull their fingers out. Um, the taxpayers helped them out in the last financial crisis, and it's they need to make it a lot easier um what i do know is for those that can access it um a lot of banks um such as natwest and barclays were actually um sort of decreeing that uh the directors of limited companies should have a personal guarantee against these loans um which is a bit terrifying um i think they have now sort of done a little u-turn there and that's only for loans of over two hundred and fifty thousand pounds um but even so that's um that's not sort of how the government had set it out and how it uh, appeared uh, to be towards us. So um, it'll be interesting to see when that gets fully um, passed in legislation as well. Um, however, if you can access a loan, um, I would recommend it as a cheap way of financing something if there was something as a business that you were looking to purchase, sort of any assets or uh, PPE or equipment, um, or looking into, yeah, it's just a really cheap way to finance something. So that's quite a savvy use of funds there. Uh, mm -hmm. But overall, I think it falls short a bit too much for limited companies. It could definitely go a lot further. And so uh, so looking at those two areas, because those with one another, um, a lot of the people who fall under the self-employment of it will be people who fall into the small business support kind of areas of things. What do you guys, so Alex, you've already touched upon some of the limitations, but overall, um, what do you think are the positives and negatives of these provisions or the areas that people should look out for when they're navigating these schemes? Um, I, I think <laughs> I think that, um, so, you, you, you know, if, if you are, clearly if, if you are, um, if your own profits are below fifty thousand, I think the scheme works work, work, works pretty well, um, and and I think that given given that if, if if we assume for now that people can hang on until June, then then actually I think I, th I think it probably does does the job um, for larger businesses, um, certainly for for for, for companies. Um, what I think we're seeing now, which is what the government has not traditionally encouraged us to do is to play the sort of game of financial engineering. So, um, you know, we've always been told to, to, to put aside your, 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 your tax savings and, and, and not to spend it. And now we're, now we're being encouraged to, uh, and, I, and I, I am encouraging clients to do this if they can, to, to, to defer, defer their VAT and defer their self-assessment uh, bills. Um, but it's, it's not really getting to the root of the, of, of, of the issue here. And I, and I am worried that we are deferring a problem from today into 2021. Um, and, and, and I don't really have a, have a, have a very good um, solution because um, it, it's, it's, it's clearly not going to be possible to save every business um, in, 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 this, in this period. I think what the government has done, and you can take your own view on this, is they've said we're going to we're going to protect workers, and we're, we're going to make sure that there's a kind of um, a minimum floor. Um, but they'll, 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 certainly, I, know, I I have clients that that um, will not survive this um, this um, th th this period, and um, and I, I I can't really see another way out for them uh, in in the absence of any more support measures. Yeah. Fia, did you have anything? And Rad, I could see your hand up as well. Yeah, yeah. just to say, uh, I, I, um, I'm ready to answer that question as and when. So when is an appropriate okay. time to come back to me? Great, we'll come to you in a moment. So Fia first and then we'll go over to Rad. Yeah, I guess, I guess sort of in answer to uh, the sort of final part of your question, which was sort of what could people sort of do in this time is, uh, and again, it does lean into, does this 
uh, you know, roll into a 2021 problem. But because cash is not available straight away, um, it is about managing cash flow and financial engineering, as you said, Alex. And there are things you could do if you've got outgoings, but no incomings, have these difficult conversations with suppliers, with landlords, uh, people that you pay rent to, um, because everyone is in the same position. And that's going to help your chances if you've got a more ca positive cash flow of surviving this period. Um, as Alex said, not everyone is going to make it through this period um, in terms of yeah, business success. So look after your cash flow as much as you can. That does mean there probably will be problems going into 2021, uh, but positive cash flow is the only way to stay afloat really. Yeah, and um, Rad, so you've got your answer to the anticipated answer to the question that we had before. Yes, so it's not, it's, it's, um, it's an all right answer, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, uh, there's a, a bloke on Twitter called Paul Lewis, uh, and he's a financial journalist. Um, and his uh, handle is Paul Lewis Money uh, at Paul Lewis Money, um, financial uh, journalist, broadcaster, and public speaker. What he said in a tweet uh, earlier today, um, sorry, uh, not earlier today, 31st of March, is that people who are furloughed and being paid 80% of their regular salary can take on other work as their employment contract, uh, so long as their employment contract doesn't forbid it. And it then says info from HMRC this morning. Now, that makes complete sense to me uh, in that there's, there's not going to be anything in the scheme um, which prevents you from working. The scheme is just not going to, it's not going to legislate to stop you from working whilst you're furloughed. It stops you from working for your employer, but it's not going to stop you doing other work. Um, but the caveat is, is it depends on what your employment contract says. So um, often your employment contract will stop you from working for, for, for other people. Um, or it will say, with consent of your employer, if you want to work with somebody else, you need to get your consent from us. So in answer to the person who's, um, who's messaged in to say, look, um, my contract says that, um, that I'm not allowed to do any work for anybody else. Um, I don't think it's really for an employer to now say you can't do any work uh, whilst you're furloughed what you need to do or what somebody needs to do is look in what their original employment contract says and see whether it forbids them from working if it forbids them from working for anybody else then but is that is that contract which binds them if your employer now says we don't allow you to well that's them attempting to vary the contract and um uh, i'm uh I think that it's then for the employee to say, well, look, um, I'm not necessarily accepting your variation, but I think um, it goes back to what the contract says. And, and, and so one way of thinking about it is imagine this didn't happen and you wanted to work for somebody else, would you be able to? So ignore the furloughing scheme and say, yeah. can I work for somebody else? And that, that's the way um, for the person who's put the question in, that's the way I would again think about it. Imagine if we weren't uh, on the scheme, and we weren't thinking about this, can you work for somebody else? That's a that's a really helpful answer. Thank you so much there, Ed, for that. And actually, we've had another question which has come in, and I think it's a question that Alex can answer. And um, it ties in, I think we've, we've sort of covered it, but just to make sure that this particular scenario is covered. And um, if you're a limited company, and you pay yourself a salary and also dividends, not in work at the moment due to COVID, are you entitled to any of the help? Um, you, you are entitled to um, some help. So you can furlough yourself under the job retention scheme. Um, most of these um, owner managed companies pay themselves a small salary and the rest by dividends. So the amount they'll get will be by reference to what they've been paying themselves through PAYE. There's absolutely no support for dividends. Uh, none of the schemes will, will, will uh, address dividends. Um, obviously, you can defer self-assessment tax bills and, and uh, VAT deferral if you're VAT registered and things like the mortgage payment holiday and, and you get a loan. Um, but I think actually owner managed companies um, who often sort of consider themselves as self-employed but are legally not self-employed have probably fallen through the cracks in quite a big way um, and, and have quite a lot of, um, can, can quite rightfully, I think, feel a bit hard done by. Yeah. 
So Ore, I know that you had a comment to make in with regards to areas that are potential pitfalls in both of the schemes that Afia and Alex have set out for us. What did you want to say? Um, it's pretty much aligned exactly to what Alex just mentioned. So I think I said in the beginning of my intro that I am an, am an independent contractor that works through a limited company. So I am that person that pays myself a salary, um, but also takes the majority of my income out as dividends. Um, I actually read somewhere that the average um, contractor pays himself just a salary of £719 a month to obviously make their tax-free uh, maximum, um, which means if they get this 80% payment back, they're only going to get £575. So I think for somebody who effectively all their earnings come through their contractor day rate, come through their limited company and the dividends they pay themselves, there's a massive, I guess, pitfall or con, whatever you want to call it, in regards to the fact that they're not really going to be addressed through either of these schemes. Mm -hmm. um, and really the only way in which they'll be able to claim money back is if they then go on to universal credit. Um, I think one of the other things, which is a great area, um, when I was doing my research around um, limited company directors, for example, that want to um, go via the PAYE employee scheme, um, you have to obviously show that your income has been impacted by, by COVID and, and by Corona. So obviously it depends on how things work out, but there's a, there's a potential that most contractors have very short notice periods so uh, mine typically is four weeks but I know a lot of friends that have two week contract uh, notice periods some even have down to one week it could be that your client or your employee just um your employer sorry just calls notice on your contract how do you prove then that actually your contract was terminated as a result of corona or or, or just because they've served their four week to uh, two week notice period and that's the reason why um your kind of work has been dissolved so therefore in those instances are you still able then to claim um as a un under either of these schemes and I think that's still a question I think there was also a question in the few places I've read around whether or not it, you can furlough yourself if you're the only director um, and only employee sorry because there should for any company still be one person who's working within the business to do I guess basic tasks like um, file returns, pick up posts, answer emails, et cetera. So if you are a director and sole employee and you furlough yourself, there's a gray area in terms of whether that's actually going to be accepted. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any clarity on whether or not that's true so Rad, or not, but that's what I read. So Brad had his hand up, I think, in reference to your first question, and Alex had his hand up in reference to your second. So if we go to Rad first. Yeah, so um, the question about... Um, the reason why I think what you're raising is how do you prove that you were given notice or had your contract terminated because of coronavirus? And um, I think the easiest way to do that is ask your employer, uh, ask the, the, the company you're con contracting with and say, look, um, uh, you're, con you're terminating uh, earlier than anticipated. Um, is this because of coronavirus? Because usually there's going to be some correspondence. And I think most employers would say, would be upfront and say, yes, and um, all of this is kicked off and we've had to dismiss the contractors before we dismiss the employees. And so that will give you sufficient evidence, you would hope, to show that the reason for your termination was because um, uh, of uh, uh, coronavirus. I think I'll leave Alex to, to address the sole director question. Um, I've read some tweets about it, but I think probably Alex is in a better position than me to answer that. Yeah, if we jump over to Alex then. Um, it, 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 again, we, it, get, um, Rad said it before, um, this is all guidance at the moment until we look at the legislation, then you know, it's, it's, it's anyone's game. The understanding at the moment is that a, a director can, for, of, who is the only employee of their company, can furlough themselves for the benefit of job retention scheme, but you can't do any work for the company except for statutory duties so so fulfilling company law like you said like f f filing returns keeping up to date with company's house um that is in in writing in the guidance um it wasn't the the the, the, the guidance gets updated quite regularly um so it's it's quite a challenge to keep up to date with with what's new and what isn't um but that that uh, that i think we we do know that a company director can further themselves. 
Okay, that's really helpful. And um, we had a couple of other questions which came in and I know that they're very specific in terms of their scenarios. What I'll do is I'll read them out. And if they are questions that we don't have the immediate answer to, um, as always, we will upload further content on our um, Instagram and on our Twitter. So if we can't spe specifically answer your scenario now, we will look up those questions and try and provide the answers later. So the first question that we had that came through uh, was, who actually can apply for universal credit? Is it for anyone who's not working? And if so, does it take into account spousal income? So Fia, I know that you and I spoke about this um, before you came on. Is this something that you've had a chance to be able to look up or is it something that we, can, we should deal with later? I think we'll deal with it as a whole question later um, on the basis that I'm, I'm just not a specialist with sort of welfare and, yeah. and as, as, in that respect. That said, I do know that your spousal income um, does affect um, whether you are entitled to it or not the threshold is 16 I think if your spouse has 16,000 pounds in savings that will affect your ability to claim universal credit um, I'd, I'd need to look into more so we can come back to that in the the next episode and um, I'll research that for you definitely and the person who asked the question just to, to say to them um, I had a quick look to see if I could find just a, like a, a quick answer to it. What I would say is that the Gov UK website is very regularly updated with guidance on this particular area. Um, so if you type in gov.uk forward slash universal hyphen credit, and then also look at gov.uk forward slash guidance, um, and then new style employment and support allowance that deals with various scenarios as to uh, what benefits you can claim if you are advised to self-isolate, if you're unable to work and you don't quite qualify for any schemes. Um, it goes into whether you should claim for universal credit, employment support allowance, and also how your household income is uh, worked out and calculated uh, for things that you can look at. But we will try and come back to that question to provide an answer. Then there was another I've dropped, question. So just, just, just sorry to drop, jump in, I've actually oh, yeah. dropped them into the, um, for those who are watching live, I've dropped them into the chat as well in case you need as Thank well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then yeah. the next um, question that we had, which again is a very specific factual scenario, was if a supply teacher is on a daily rate covering a maternity contract with tax and NI deducted at source, are they entitled to any of the help, particularly over the summer holidays where they won't be paid? So the way that I read that is that it's somebody who's being paid under the PAYE scheme, um, I think. And in which case, I think we've, we've sort of touched upon it because it, it reads as though if they are were being paid under P, PAYE at the relevant date in March that RAD uh, provided to us, they should qualify for the uh, furlough payments. RAD's got his thumbs up and a fear, yeah, I think he's so, ready to jump in. So yeah, that would be my understanding of it. If they, I mean, if you've been sort of engaged on a contractual term, but through PAYE and during that period of that contract, i.e. March to June, um, when you thought you would be working, it's now been interrupted, then yes, you absolutely should uh, be able to benefit from the employee um, grant at least. So uh, the hope there would be that, you know, if you're a teacher, the school is is applying for that grant on your behalf. Again, it does have the pitfall of it being up to your employer to sort that out. Um, but on the basis that they are, you know, being proactive and getting on top of that, then I presume that you would be entitled to 80% of and your- And also, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's so, so, something to point out actually in relation to schools, and this was touched upon in our education episode, is that schools are in a slightly different position to other businesses because, and, and somebody who works as a school governor, they we have budgets each year for schools, and so actually the school should have a budget to pay you as a teacher, regardless of whether you have gone into work or not. They're in a they're in a slightly different position to other employers, and so I I, I wonder why it is. That, that school's ability to pay you should be affected by COVID. They should actually have that financial budget to one side. And Rad's got his hand up again. Go on, Rad. Yeah, sorry. So, so the guy that talks about public sector workers specifically, um, uh, and uh, I'll try and uh, cut, cut through it, but basically it suggests that um, public sector workers shouldn't be furloughed and should just be paid. That's the, the yeah. nuts and bolts of it. So, because ultimately it's all public money. And so, yeah. um, you know, if you're a public sector worker, broadly speaking, the guidance says you should get paid, not get furloughed. Good. 
Um, great, good answer. Okay, so our next area, because uh, Timmy, I don't think you've said anything so far, have you? We've not actually come to you at all. Um, so guys, you're going to hear Timmy speak now. Um, oh, hi. So Timmy, <laughs> so Timmy and Ore are going to talk to us about the real impact of the policies on work situations. They're both in quite unique positions, if you, as you've heard from their intros, um, where they are a mixture of being business owners, contractors, and so on. So um, one of the questions that um, I had, because I know this has come up in conversations that you and I have had together already, um, is in terms of like your childcare provision and how you're managing working from home uh, whilst having a very adorable but very active toddler around with you at the same time. Has that had any impact for you in terms of your ability to work and to earn money? Um, it hasn't impacted my ability to earn money because my contract has remained the same. So I'm still getting paid per day, irrespective of where I'm working. Um, I think it's just changed the nature of the working environment. So obviously you're going to have uh, conference calls and there may be a toddler running in the background or she may be having a meltdown and screaming um, or asking for a snack the many myriad of things that she requires of us um, so so yeah it's changed the nature of that however I work for a, um, a major global bank um, and obviously many people there all have children and are all dealing with the same situation of a lot of the schools and nurseries being closed um, so everyone's actually in the same position it's actually quite interesting and quite nice when you when you jump on a call and someone's holding their toddler or their child's in the background asking for something I think um my bank in particular has been very understanding of it and actually I've noticed quite a few colleagues have put um kind of notes on this on their email signatures saying that due to childcare constraints, I won't be able to attend all the regular meetings I was before, and I might have to be more flexible with the time in which we can have calls. So people are kind of actively signposting the fact that I have children that may impact how kind of my working environment and be aware of that. Do you find, Ored, that there are more calls now that we're working virtually and remotely as opposed to less? Is it, or is it just me? Uh, yeah, no, 100%. I think now a lot of the, so I think certain set calls have always been there um, especially when you work for a global team where people aren't just in the same location but now it's more like kind of quick catch-ups where you would just grab someone at their desk or just say let's grab quickly grab a coffee and let's just discuss this for two minutes that's now kind of got to be a zoom call or a jab of communication or something you've kind of got to it's a lot harder to quickly grab someone for a second without it being a formal meeting and Timmy, um, you had some interesting perspectives to bring in about. So we had a question which was around being small business owners looking after your employees. And I know that mm. you predominantly work with freelancers through your um, aspects of work. But what were you, what were the points that you had that you wanted to raise and bring up in this particular area? Yeah, it's been really interesting to see both from small businesses and larger businesses that I think a lot of employers are depending on their industry, finding that, you know, roles that they previously said and believed could not be done remotely, you know, the kind of roles that would typically be enforced as office-based roles are now being exposed as being perfectly <laughs> fine to work from home. Um, and, you know, thinking long-term, I think that's going to have a massive impact on the way that we do business as a country, as a continent, across the world really uh, because we are really having our eyes opened that so much can be done via zoom via telephone call you know without being physically in the place of work however on the other side where I am seeing the massive impact is on you know especially hospitality businesses um, entertainment businesses you know where this lockdown has really hampered um, well essentially shut down so many different uh, industries and sectors that rely on people being able to travel and visit their place of work uh, the, the one thing I would say about the government's reaction is it has felt a little bit slow in that you know just as was mentioned earlier on the call I know a lot of business owners who had had to make a large number of their staff redundant before then finding that the government was going to support them um, with with uh, with the job retention scheme, you know, it's been great to hear. But but there is going to be a massive backtrack now from a lot of small and medium sized business owners to get their employees back onto the books and back under employment, and then put onto furlough. Um, which for you know small HR departments, which are often 
one person as the HR department is going to have quite a big impact on, on their workload. But of course, it's definitely a positive thing that that support is going to be there from the government. It's just harmful to relationships as well, though, isn't it? Like I can imagine if you as an employee had been working somewhere for whatever period of time and you felt that you had this sort of like close relationship with your employer, or they understood your situation and they've made you redundant. The idea that you then have to go back to them and then you're being paid less and so on. Like e Even though that comes in, it, it damages that sort of whatever the goodwill had been that had built up between the employer and employee. And, and I know that you work obviously as a, as a sort of business consultant, strategist and so on. What are the what are practical tips that you would give to these businesses who find themselves in those types of positions? So either businesses that are, that are hospitality based, what are the survival tips that you give to them as to strategies they can put in place to try and ride out the pandemic? And also in terms of reaching out to employees, what, what sort of uh, things would you suggest to them to bring those employees back on board and to make them feel valued again? Yeah, I think the key factor that's affecting every single business is, um, sorry, is that my mic that's not clear? Just check. No, it's mine. Okay. Uh, I think the key factor for every business, small or large, is cash flow at the moment. You know, the reason that the employees have been made redundant is that the business that they're working for is often struggling to maintain its cash flow beyond the month ahead or a month or one pay cycle ahead. And so finding ways to maximize cash flow or, you know, retain cash flow at this time is, is absolutely vital. Um, I'm seeing a lot of businesses looking to diversify at this time. So, you know, we've, we've already seen the likes of Dyson and Ineos and Rolls-Royce and others being asked to look at making, you know, uh, surgical masks and protective equipment for the NHS and others. I believe Dyson are, are this week manufacturing over 20,000 ventilators to go into yeah. the NHS. They call it uh, the Covent. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't was... help it always marketing <laughs> always marketing um and so there's there's a huge demand for diversification right now i think a, a really key sector that i've spoken to a couple of people about is going to be the work from home sector you know there's going to be a lot of demand for work from home solutions uh you know making sure that people have the ergonomic environment that they need to be able to work from home effectively i would definitely suggest that businesses are having to look at diversifying their outputs and diversifying their offering uh, especially over the next six months because to be perfectly frank every expert that i'm speaking to does not expect this to go away by the summer or over the next two to mm. three months this this is going to be at least a six month situation that, that we're facing and so you know, for a business to survive, it really, really is going to have to find ways to pivot. Uh, and it's going to have to do that quite quickly. Well, I mean, the uh, fact that the self-employed scheme doesn't come in until June, and then it's going to last for three months is indicative of how long the government thinks it's going to be going on for, isn't it? Um, a fear. So I know that you're about to jump in. You had a brilliant scheme. I, I think you were actually one of the first people that I noticed recognizing that this was going to be an issue and coming up with strategies straight away as yeah. to how you could make your business viable so do you want to share some of the stuff that you've um, done to help with yeah. Lime Heart and with Coco Financial as well absolutely so um as I mentioned um I run a street food business which I closed down before the government even told us that we should close down because um just commercial reasons I was speaking to my customers and the footfall was reducing quite quickly and I, I remember on it was Friday the 13th I started asking my customers I was like are you guys in next week like the the footfall is just dropping and dropping are you all working from home to which I'd say about nine out of ten customers told me yeah we're, we're not going to be back here and the street uh, food market in in Soho is predominantly um, you know the main audience are people that work in the offices nearby so it became very clear to me that my revenue was about to fall off by 90 percent um, and uh, it just didn't make sense for me to trade it would cost me yeah I'd be make, I'd be operating at a loss um I made a decision again before the government has stepped in that I was just going to pay my staff um because it felt like the right thing to do I've got a very good relationship with my staff they come out in the wind the the rain the snow um and I yeah it was uh me showing my appreciation to them because it, it's the right thing to do um 
That said, as you mentioned, Timmy, cash flow is so important. And I immediately started thinking about how can I weather this storm? A lot of people presume that working in street food, the, the answer is just deliver. But unlike some restaurants that, you know, have commercial A1 kitchens, that even though they shut their doors to the public, they can still um, do delivery. As a street food business, all of us found ourselves in the place where our registered business address was our home, where we perhaps do very minor food prep, you know, mm chopping something for salad but we don't have commercial extractor vans and licenses to be able to offer that delivery service and I think some rogue traders perhaps would do but I've got a five-star hygiene rating and I would never risk that so for me right now I'm unable to make have any income so I decided to operate a voucher scheme whereby my engaged customers and new customers could um, support by buying a voucher that helps me with my cash flow immediately now but it's not a handout at all it's an IOU um, so that when life does resume to normality and it will because this shall pass uh, people can then book me use the voucher to purchase food, street food products or book me for private chef um, experiences or, or whatever it may be um, because not only does that give me cash flow in the now, it's actually thinking ahead to ensuring that I still have an engaged customer base. Yeah. Because it's very easy for that to just drop off and you'd have to start from scratch. And I've worked very hard in the wind and the rain, as I mentioned a few times, to, to build this business. Uh, and there's no way I'm starting from scratch. So that's one option I did, but it's also about pivoting and understanding what you can do to diversify. And a few projects I had in the pipeline um, that you know were perhaps going to be worked on in 2020 or 2021 have just been brought forward. COVID-19 has forced my hand to do so, which is probably a good thing. So yes, yeah. it, it's important to pivot and stay relevant. Um, if you're going I, to I thought, Afia, I thought your voucher scheme was was absolutely genius because, like you say, it's not just about the cash flow. It also means that people are then incentivized to to jump back in again once this is done. And I was watching the um, FT session that they did yesterday, where they clearly stole our idea and got some way less interesting panelists together to have a, a, a similar ish discussion. Um, and one thing that they pointed out was that although they were having discussions it's something we'll delve into next week about what they think overall this is going to do to the economy um and they were saying that they think there might be this surge of demand after the pandemic is over where people basically have been cooped up and they're just rushing to get out there and socialize again and um enjoy each other's company so it's a good idea if you're working in hospitality to start gearing towards or thinking about if you can getting clients through the door later i guess this is sort of along the lines of your thinking and I know Ore you had something that you wanted to jump in on just now yeah so it was a bit about some things we'd spoken about um previously I know we've kind of talked about how companies need to pivot now that everyone's working remotely and the fact that it's brought up that it's clearly possible for many roles and jobs to be done um, at a distance um, even though many employees didn't think that was the case. Um, my current role actually is kind of global head for communications and engagement for the bank that I work for and one of the things that has been has come up as part of my role but a lot of people I don't think are talking about it enough is actually the health and well-being impacts of working remotely so yeah. although it is great that we can do it and that it is possible employers in particular need to be really aware of the changes from a well-being perspective that, that will bring for their employees being at home for effectively an untold period of time at the moment with all your family, all your kids, um, and still having to work a full-time job. A lot of people are finding they're working longer hours because they, it's half them to shut off. Um, a lot of people aren't taking the same breaks that they would take. So whereas you might kind of walk to the toilet or go and get a coffee break and have a chat with one of your colleagues, you're kind of just finding yourself sitting at the same desk or on your sofa or bed or wherever it is. Um, similarly, some people have found that it's hard for them to... Um, get into the habit of it sounds bad but I guess like waking up and just taking a shower because you know you feel like you're at home anyway so do I need to kind of put on proper clothes or can I just stay in pajamas all day and actually when you yeah, do the I'm latter laughing, so I'm laughing because I and I have definitely texted each other at about 8 p.m and just been like I've only just showered have you showered yet <laughs> I mean, at least you did shower at eight, albeit all bit late in the day. You're still you're still doing it daily, so I mean that's that's a plus. Do you know but what yeah. the giveaway is, though? The giveaway well, is that 
usually when we have our Zoom calls and people have decided not to show their faces on the screen, those are the guys that I call the, I call those guys the pajama gang. Those are the yeah, pajama that's gang. Always, that's always They're literally me. like their yeah. screen is not on, that like you can't see them. Those are the guys you call them pajama yeah. gang. I usually have like a hair bonnet on, you know, no mate. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm it's probably fully... better. Their screen is not on. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah, think, it's, my hair is so well conditioned, in... though. My hair is so I well think this, conditioned. I think now. this is the smartest I've dressed for quite a few days. So. <laughs> And it's just a t-shirt. So. <laughs> but but yeah, I was going to say, it's just getting colleagues and getting your colleagues and your team, if you are an employer, into that routine of, I guess, sticking to a routine and sticking and not just completely losing everything out of the window because you're working from home. Because if this happens for the next three months, you're going to have a lot of depressed or just kind of less happy staff, which therefore means you're probably going to see a drop in productivity or kind of more issues further down the line. I yeah, we've... we've... Yeah. Timmy, Sorry, yeah, Timmy was about to say okay. something. If we go to Timmy next, and then yeah, Aura is absolutely right. You know, I, I I was thinking about what tips you can give people when working from home, and I I would encourage everyone to continue their routine. You know, really respect working hours. Get up at, at the well, not quite the usual, but take out your travel time and get up at the time you would need to wake up to still do your normal work, have a shower, have lunch when you normally would. Um, you know, I know some large employers, my wife is currently working with Verizon and they're doing, uh, I think three days a week, they do a, a, a Zoom fitness class for everyone to, to jump onto and do some high impact, high intensity. I don't even know what HIT stands for, but they do HIT and, uh, and other things like that to keep you know, people active and keep them engaged with each other. I think it's very important to you know have contact with people who you're not working with as well just as you mm. would if if you were going into the office you know this is there's a real massive question around mental health at this time um and and just trying to live as normal a life as possible but whilst being at home is is going to be really really key and and you know the difference between small businesses and large businesses is going to be that large businesses do have that cash flow do have those cash reserves available to support their employees more proactively with things like that um you know i was speaking to some colleagues former colleagues at l'oreal and you know they've they've all been given april off uh at full pay and obviously wow. that's to be reviewed at the end of the month um but that's what a large business can do where a small yeah. business owner might struggle to do that um that's that's really interesting what we'll, i think Aya, what we might do which could be helpful if we will share some resources in terms of mindfulness free mindfulness and um workout uh, resources which are available online i know that audible is one of the companies that's made a lot of their literature for the kids um, free and accessible um, to people and a lot of companies are taking on that initiative and that actually sort of ties into another mechanism coping mechanism so for example one of the areas one of the industries that had to close down quite quickly were gyms and I've definitely seen a surge in the number of people <laughs> who are now offering online workouts and it's, it's actually really great advertising isn't it because it means that you now get to try out some of the workouts that you maybe would have been afraid to go out in public to do or am I just speaking for myself when I say that but I know I'm just kind of like oh, okay maybe I can do 10 press ups in a row. <laughs> yeah, I was going to just quickly say there's actually somebody that I, I don't even follow them, but they got a massive kind of interest um, on doing live workouts on Instagram. Um, mm. So they did it for the first week. Her name's Sierra London. I um, did it for the first week. Loads of people kind of um, logged in. And I guess she realized actually I'm missing a trick here. So she started then charging for the live workouts. So rather than it being streamed on Instagram, you pay £15 a month. So similarly to as if you were paying for a gym membership. Um, and in the first three days she got four thousand people signed up so that's 60 grand wow. made wow from, from the same workout because obviously obviously she's only posting one workout anyway and it's just being the video is just being sent to four thousand people um and they're paying yeah 60 grand a month yeah that's the amazing. body so, coach um yeah. joe wicks is is very popular on youtube he he was on sky news maybe end of the week before last as schools were closed and, and he's been doing PE classes every morning for, mm. for school children. And, and you know, the, the, he's getting one to three million views a day. And, and that off the top of my head is, is in the tens of thousands of pounds in advertising revenue, um, which I believe he's donating back to the NHS in some way or in part. Um, but, but yeah, there's, there are huge opportunities for, for fitness and especially linked with YouTube to, to pay quite nicely right now. 
That's great. So Rad, you've got a question and then I think Fia wanted to say something before and I actually have a question for Alex as well. So um, Rad, Fia, then Alex. Yeah, it, it was uh, something on, uh, that Timmy said earlier, which I thought was um, uh, insightful and something I've been thinking about too, which is that um, employers have been saying for ages, oh, you can't work from home, this has got to be done in the office. And now everybody's working from home. Um, and from an, a discrimination perspective, Claim the, the main complaint tends to be from women who want to work from home, uh, who've got childcare responsibilities, and law firms are horrendous at this sort of thing. Law firms yeah. are always saying, "Oh, you can't work at home." Da, da, da. And I've like, advised loads of um, female lawyers um, about this, and it's kind of nice that now chickens have come home to roost because everybody's working from home, and it's going to it's going to change the landscape. Of, of course, there are like lots of negatives and the mental health difficulties, which I think there's going to be a huge upsurge in depression. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, uh, and uh, lots of people do struggle with the lack of structure from working from home. But there are some positives, and some of the positives are going to be that when all of this is, is passed and however long that takes, that actually um, uh, it's going to be much harder for an employer to say, no, sorry, you can't work from home. And that is going to yeah. make the life of parents uh, women and men, and actually maybe that the, 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 um, now men will work from home more and carry out more of their childcare responsibilities. Brad, so you I think took they're... my exact point I was going to yeah. say. Everything he said is what my point yeah. was, basically. Sorry. I think it's all right. But as someone yeah. who is not yet a parent, um, this has highlighted to me that something that I've always um, wondered and maybe worried slightly um about um because my father actually was a he worked from home for most of my childhood I've got a younger brother um with various learning difficulties and disabilities and he made that decision for our family um because it just made sense for him but he definitely did sort of see um his career slow down as a result of making that choice as a man um, and I know that women are used to um, sort of seeing that sort of um, repercussion with their career for doing that. So I just think this is a win for parents generally. And as someone who is not yet a parent, but hopes to be in the future, I do think that the world will never be the same after this and nor should it be. And um, this will hopefully be a win for, for all parents. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think some of the points that you guys have touched upon and it's really showing just how interlinked each of these areas are because a lot of what you guys have mentioned have been things which we've touched upon in the health and in the education episodes. The, the doctors were quite frank on the healthcare episodes where they basically said that because the emphasis has to be on flattening the curve, that they're sort of delaying, that the healthcare strategy is just sort of delaying these repercussions which are going to flow from undoubtedly a surge in mental health issues and depression and also from a legal perspective from a law perspective I know that we're already seeing a surge in things like domestic violence issues and so on which have arisen there's issues around housing the overcrowding of housing for people who are now having to isolate and to social uh, you know uh, practice social distancing and my hope is that these this period will highlight a lot of the cracks that we have in terms of the welfare system, in terms of discrimination, and will force the government into action to deal with those areas because it will bring it to the forefront. But unfortunately, I think people are going to suffer quite a lot in the short term. Um, and it's the question that I had for you was, um, I know from speaking to you and emailing you and so on, that you guys moved quite quickly to the working from home scenario at Philip Freed and Co. I just wanted to see from your perspective, do you think that actually productivity has increased, decreased, has it changed from your perspective as, as an employer, how you're going to run your business moving forward? Um, I think so, so, so I, I took the, so um, for reasons I, I won't get into, I took the decision to go home and, and not go into the office um, before the government guidance. And I sort of, I, I thought, well, there's, the, 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 there's no way that I can do this for myself and not offer it to my, to my colleagues. Um, so we, we, I offered all of them individually. Um, they wanted to go home uh, and work from home on the, on the, on the 8th of, of, of March, which was quite early. Um, seven out of the nine of our team decided to do that and and, and they, they all you know we got them kitted out and, and uh, sort of had a sort of fairly manic day of getting everything couriered to them um, my, my, my sense of it is is that because 
different people do different things in different professions. So I, fi- I find myself now I'm, I'm just run off my feet. I'm working all day. And some of the people that I uh, sort of do, do a similar job to me are finding that they're doing a lot of work. I, I, I'm sure that there's probably some productivity losses for some, for some people, but I, 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 I think that if people are going to muck around during the working day, they'll, they'll do it in the office or they'll do it at home. And actually, if you if you can't trust your staff to work from home, you're probably not working with the right people, certainly with a, with, with a small firm. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think, I think this is, this, this is now sort of thrust it into the conversation. And if, if, if my colleagues want to do working from home in the future, well, clearly that, that it should be by default, it should be something that, that they should be entitled to. Um, I think there's, there's kind of, you know, there's, there's a few nuances that I'm still trying to, trying to work out. Like you, you can't really fob people off in the same way because everyone knows <laughs> you're, at, you're, you're at home. So, it's so you, know, <laughs> you can't, you, you know, if, someone, if, if a client calls and you don't want to speak to them, you can't be like, um, you can't say you're picking out for a meeting. Um, I was walking the dog. <laughs> um, He's got it covered. <laughs> But but um, but in, but in, in in general, I think we're probably we probably sped up a lot of the trends that we were already looking at, and and it's it's now a great experiment for how how we can work. And whether we even need offices, I mean, a lot of with Coco yeah. Financial, a lot of my clients right now, I mean, one in particular was actually about to put down a big deposit on a brand new office space, twice the size of their current one. Um, literally the week we decided to start working wow. from home, um, and um, yeah, they're now looking at this as an experiment because if it works then why on earth would you need a, a huge plush office which is one of the biggest outgoings um in, on you know on their PL. um and then it does beg the question do we all even need to live in london why don't we just go live in you know <laughs> in a beautiful <laughs> countryside for go, going price. too far there yeah. now so yeah going too far <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about say, cheaper housing costs. <laughs> what, what I would say as somebody who works in the industry, I think, Raj, you've probably experienced this as well. I don't know if you experience it in the same way because you do a different area of law to me, but certainly with crime, lots of the work has moved, well, lots of the papers, service of papers and so on has moved to being served digitally. So we have fewer reasons to go into chambers. What I would say is I actually quite miss going into your chambers to work and there's definitely a sort of um like a, f- a friendliness and a familial atmosphere that we miss out on quite a lot as a set and I, I see other criminal sets experience that as, that as well because we're all like independent workers who predominantly work from home so we consciously have to make these efforts now to have these social events to check in with one another um and we I, I really miss it so I, I really hope that it doesn't skew too much the other way I think it is actually very important when you're a business and you're running it with a bunch of employees who need to work together and have that sort of relationship to make sure there is a physical base and that there is that contact was there something you wanted to say to me so we'll move to yeah, me I think, and yeah, then we're going to deal with IR35 and mortgage um, implications as well so um, go on to me sorry yeah just briefly on that point you know we are human beings and, and a lot of um, the energy depending if you're an extrovert or introvert you know you might find your energy in different ways but a lot of us need that social interaction I think there are certain aspects of business if I think about my sales background I could not sell remotely you know i have to be in front of a client i have to be presenting in person to have the biggest possible impact um so so there will definitely be adjustments and and a reduction in the need for for physical working space but but i think there will also be that continuation of the need to be face to face especially to do business and and to to come to business agreements and different things but but, you know over this period i have heard of people doing pitches and and you know business presentations business development presentations via zoom and and digital uh, resources yeah. so so yeah there will definitely be a shift um so or you wanted to talk to us about ir35 um and sort of one of the unexpected consequences or positive consequences that have happened as a result of this and um, so first of all actually could you explain what ir35 is because the yeah. only reason i know what ir35 is is because of you <laughs> No worries. So I've actually Googled it up just so I'm going to use an official term as opposed to my what thing. <laughs> um, so it says IR35 is a piece of legislation that allows HMRC to collect additional payment 
where a contractor is an employee in all but name. If a contractor is operating through an intermediary, such as a limited company, and all but for that intermediary, they would be an employee of their client, IR35 kicks in. So effectively what that means is where um, a lot of contractors like myself operate through a limited company and we're directors of our company, um, but we kind of go into the same office every day. We have an office laptop, we have an office, so when I say office, sorry, I mean, clients let's say I work for Barclays I have a Barclays laptop I have a Barclays um, employee entrance pass I have an email address at Barclays.com I'm effectively an employee of Barclays but I am an independent contractor through a limited company they are saying or they were saying sorry then that in that instance um, we should be taxed as an employee which therefore means you kind of go on to PAYE and you pay your regular I don't know what the rate is like 40 50 percent uh, tax etc and then you don't therefore take the benefits of the limited company I guess, tax breaks that you would get. Yeah. So only, only paying 20% corporation tax, for example, and strategically paying yourself a salary and dividends. Um, so I thought like if I was a bit of a, for some people it was a win, for me it wasn't. So um, the when kind of uh, everything started kicking off with COVID-19, uh, one of the things that the government um, agreed was that they'd push back the introduction of IR35 for um, these limited company contractors until the following year. So it was meant to come into play, I believe April 1 um, this year, and it will now come into play later. So for those people who are contractors for companies where they didn't do anything, as in make any changes and they weren't going to make any changes until April 1st it's been great for them because they can now continue to trade as a limited company and get paid as such um, and then their employer will just deal with that situation next year when it comes up um, unfortunately for me and a lot of people that work in kind of bigger very very large organizations global banking in particular they knew that this legislation was coming and they put in place um, the changes that were required um, months and months before so um, probably I would say from December last year and um, we've been notified of it and we've been told that you either have to move over to PAYE as a contractor or leave the bank effectively and that they weren't going to take on any limited company contractors at all so I actually made the move over from working as my, under my limited company to working as a PAYE contractor literally I think like three or four weeks ago um, so that was fun when that announcement came out <laughs> um, so for those of us in that scenario, yeah, we, we're, we're not we're not benefiting from the fact that there's been this delay. Um, you could look but at it the in the sense that you're is... now an employee. Is that what yeah, you're exactly. say? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you're now an employee. So you could um, benefit from that employee, you know, employee retention scheme. However, this goes back to my point around um, previously around your um, notice periods. You're still going to have a well. I still have a four week. Some people still have two week notice periods. You could be um, served notice for your contract um, and you then have to then prove your employer would have to agree that the reason for that was um, COVID-19 as opposed to anything else. And similarly, there'll also be contractors whose contracts are just ending. Um, so it's just coming to a place of termination during this time, which is still crazy. And obviously it's now gonna be impossible to get new contractual work um, and in that instance then they are not covered because you weren't let go or you didn't lose a job because of um, the, the, the virus you your contract had just ended and unfortunately the employment market is such that you're going to struggle to get another contract during this time so yeah, yeah. Mm. Timmy um, you wanted to discuss mortgage implications so that'll be our, our last area of discussion and then I'm going to go around and ask you all to tell us what you've been doing with your time now that you're not allowed to go out of the house anymore so Timmy. Yeah so it was just coming back to you know thinking about how this has had an impact and, and how you can mitigate that uh, as, as mentioned earlier cash flow really important I think is important for individuals as well as uh, businesses um, and so the mortgage repayment holidays that are being offered uh, I think are a great way to try and whether you're a business or an individual to try and support yourself during this time. Um, if you go through to your mortgage provider's website, they should, I checked the other day and not everyone, but most big lenders do now have uh, some sort of mortgage repayment holiday offering. And what they'll basically do is they will defer uh, three months of mortgage payments for you on your, on your residential mortgage. 
At first, this also wasn't available for buy-to-let properties, but they have now extended it. Most lenders have now extended it to buy-to-let properties. And to be perfectly honest, both are pretty important. From an individual perspective, of course, having three months of not having to pay your, your mortgage is, is beneficial. It does push your mortgage term that little bit longer, but from speaking to a broker, it doesn't mean that you have to, or it doesn't mean that your remortgage date is delayed by three months. It just means that your full term is three months longer. So you would still be able to remortgage as originally planned. Um, on the buy to let side, you know, as, as a landlord, I've already had tenants asking to change their, their repay or change their rent payment cycle, as it were. Um, and so, you know, again, if, if property or buy to let properties are part of your business portfolio, I would definitely suggest looking into securing that mortgage from your lenders, as you are quite likely to have tenants asking the question um, about deferred rent. Um, and so that does give you some flexibility as well. So, so yeah, definitely something to support cash flow on both the individual side and, and the, the business side. Um, I would definitely encourage everyone to look at mortgage holidays. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much for all of your contributions. Um, what I'm going to do now is ask you each, because we're going to wrap up, because it's, well, I know we started late, but we're now at 10 past nine. Um, I'm going to ask you each what you've been up to uh, in your evenings where you've been locked up, nowhere else to go. Have you been productive? Have you picked anything up? Have you learned something about yourself or the person that you're living with that you'd like to share with all of our listeners? Um, so something that I shared previously was that I was going to try to become the queen of TikTok. Um, I did one video and I got some positive feedback on it. So I think I found my <laughs> niche, guys. Timmy, why are you laughing at me? Timmy, why are you laughing? Timmy, why are you laughing at me? He no, something unmuted. else. There was something else. You actually unmuted your else. microphone to was laugh TikTok at me. TikTok where you started singing? No, that was different. So I've oh God, also... no, that, that wasn't so bad. We don't, we, don't, we don't talk about that one. We don't need to discuss that one. <laughs> we can come back to that. Ayle, you haven't said anything this entire episode. What, what have you been up to since you last updated us with what you've been doing? Avoiding TikTok videos successfully. <laughs> Well done. That's Absolutely. the last one. The last one. <laughs> so I, just, yeah. I swore I swore off TikTok. I swore off TikTok <laughs> literally on the last episode that we did. And within an hour of that episode finishing, I was on a TikTok video. Epic fail. Yeah. Yeah. You good though. You're really good. You nailed the dance challenge. I think you need you to choose who you're quarantined with quarantined with. You can't really choose. <laughs> it's a lifetime quarantine, mate. That's true. All right, Afia, what have you been up to? Um, so I decided to escape London and go back to my parents' place in the countryside, which has been really lovely. My brother is home and we're just getting lots of sibling workouts in the garden, um, which is really lovely. But apart from that sort of hour workout, well, it's more like 40, yeah, 45 minute workout, I've never been busier. I don't know what's going on, despite, you know, mm. one of my businesses <laughs> closing down. I've got so much to do in the background there for keeping it relevant and, and engaged. But then on the flip side with Coco Financial, I've never been busier with clients. As you can imagine, it's a pretty crazy time. So um, I think the workaholic lives on, even though it's in the countryside. Nice. Alex, what about you? Um, I've, we've, we've got... Um, we've got a 10 month daughter at home. So she's, she's just at the, at the age where um, she needs, she's, she's incredibly high maintenance. So she just needs constant attention. So, and just, just, just like I fear I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of run off my feet with, with, with client work, which I'm very happy to, to do, I think, because lots of people are, uh, are understandably very, very concerned. Um, and I actually, I, I have this sort of goal of coming out of this, being more healthy than I, I came into it because um, we've been told we can do an hour's worth of exercise. Yeah. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't think I would ever have done an hour's exercise <laughs> in my previous life. <laughs> so I had this idea, I'm going to go back to the office, I'm going to be like shredded. Super head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll wait and see. 
I love how like now that the government has told everyone that you can't go out except to exercise now all of a sudden like everyone really really wants to get into it whereas before you probably had more free time as you guys have pointed out and you weren't using it for exercise but all of a sudden it's like the go-to thing to do um Rad what about you what have you been up to? So so I've been uh, certainly exercising more Uh, I always I've always uh, uh, ran and cycled anyway but the fact that I'm kind of stuck at home and it's the only opportunity, one of the only opportunities to leave the house means that I've managed to get myself into a good exercise routine, which is always a bit of a struggle. Um, And I should make one kind of legal caveat, which is the difference between the guidance and the regulations when it comes to exercising. Uh, (laughs) If you're you're in England, um, and this is not an encouragement for people to go out, um, but the regulations say that you can go out and they don't specify the length of time that you go out for exercise. Um, uh, in Wales, it says you can only go out once a day. Uh, I personally only go out once a day for exercise because um, it's a smart thing to do to try and limit the amount of time you go out. But mm-hmm. uh, the regulations don't actually restrict it any period of time. So um, my 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 runs have got slightly longer. And the, actually, the main thing no, the thing I've noticed is my flatmate and I are more likely to sit down and have dinner together, which we never normally do. Oh, that's so and nice. And so kind of, yeah, exactly. Because basically we've got to have some structure to the day and having dinner is a, is a way of kind of giving the day some structure, you know, bringing the day to an end. So Yeah, it's, it's I, I definitely talk, to I talk to my family way more now than I was before. If I video call my grandma really regularly, she tells me about her Mr. Motivator exercise that she's done in the morning and her like French, her learning French book that she's working her way through. So we have about three or four sentences in very broken French with one another. So no, that's that's been quite nice. Um Ore. Oh no, Timmy's next to me. Oh I no, Ore, let's go to Ore, then we'll go to Timmy. Ore, what have you been up to? Um, so I spend my time uh, forcing my friends on Instagram to do fitness challenges. It's pretty <laughs> much. I, I mean, yeah, OJ, I'm waiting for you. Fia, you're Not still happy. behind on the top, <laughs> top jump challenge, but whatever. Top um, jump tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so I've always been into fitness and working out anyway, so that hasn't changed. In fact, in fact, actually, I feel like I'm not making the most of my outside time because all the workouts I'm doing, are, I'm doing at home as opposed to kind of mm. doing it outside. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to keep saying we're all obviously in the house together. So me and my husband, uh, my daughter and my mum who looks after uh, my daughter whilst we work. Um, so it's a lot of people in uh, enclosed space a lot of the time so um yeah trying to exercise where we can I enjoy going out daily to Sainsbury's that is my um <laughs> and that enabling me to you know still have my shopping habit I also do a lot of online shopping at the moment just got a new Apple watch it's great it's kind of out of control right? I'm not gonna <laughs> no, lie it like, I'm, I'm, I'm spending, got a coffee I'm machine as well lot. yeah I got a coffee <laughs> machine the other day really recommend it Dolce Gusto um yeah Magimix, yeah, yeah I'm talking to a few about getting wow. Magimix the food processor so <laughs> basically I need I need Royal Med to stop delivering because right now Ore is keeping the economy going. I am <laughs> single handedly. Well done. Single handedly. H and M has twenty percent off kids' wear if anyone with children wants to do some clothes you, shopping. No, we're not, and they're still we're delivering. Not doing product placement. Sorry. Can Just saying. Like, um, but yeah, that's been, that, that's been me <laughs> basically. <laughs> Right. Now, Timmy. <laughs> yeah, um, first thing I'll probably say, I've never been more grateful not to have kids yet. I cannot imagine what you parents are going through. This must be the most ridiculous time to have to keep a child occupied whilst you're also trying to be productive at home. So you are all the MVPs. Um, and yeah, I'm probably pushing my plans back by about another five years. Don't tell my parents. Um, <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy the freedom and practice safe sex during this corona period. <laughs> To the max, thank you, Auntie Ore. Um, contrary to all of you as well, I'm, I'm pretty regular. Normally, I'm pretty regular in the gym, um, but since it closed, I've decided to take a fitness holiday. So, you know, seeing as summer is probably cancelled, I won't need a summer body. So, I'm waiting until there is at least a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel, and then I'll start working out properly again. So yeah, at the moment, my one hour out in the open or my time out in the open is just spent walking along the river, which is quite nice. Um, Otherwise, taking the time to work on my languages. So Duolingo, the Duolingo app is my best friend right now uh, and smashing out about three different languages at the same time, which feels quite confusing. Uh, Give us us, us a little little teaser, go on. 
uh, yo hoy una maglia. I'm working on my Italian. What did you say? Yo hoy una maglia. <laughs> it means I have a sweater. <laughs> hey, I, wonderful. How about you say something relevant to the manifesto read and say, I love the manifesto read in French, Spanish, and what's the other one? Italian, right? Yeah, j'aime, bien, j'aime bien le manifesto read. Uh, <laughs> me gusto mucho el manifesto read. And I haven't actually got to that lesson why, in Italian. Why are you speaking like, a Nigerian <laughs> accent? <laughs> All my languages are in a Nigerian accent. Leave me alone. <laughs> and then lastly, lastly, when my wife, uh, when we both finish work, well, the working day, uh, we're watching a lot of shows. And funnily enough, we found ourselves watching anything that resembles the COVID-19 outbreak. So we've actually watched Contagion. The Contagion film is decent and scarily similar to what's happening right now. Uh, yeah. Chernobyl, the Chernobyl series is pretty good as well. And uh, Cobra, if you haven't seen Cobra on Sky, that, that's quite a good one. Slightly different, but, but yeah, anything that is relevant to right now is quite scary that we're going through what people have been imagining creatively um, in the past. And lots of books are arriving on Monday. Great. I've been watching The Tiger King. Have you guys seen that? No, I'm avoiding that one, so. It's mad! It's I've mad! Heard it. <laughs> it's I've never heard of mad. it, how? <laughs> I've been working. She's in the countryside. She's in the countryside. Yeah. She's been working. I know, but still WhatsApp groups, you know. Oh, but this is what happens true. when you leave London. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not missing out on anything intellectually stimulating if you don't watch it. At but. all, it, at uh, all, it's definitely not. Intellectually I'd like stimulating to add one more thing that I've introduced into my day. I wake up every morning with this is going to be so cheesy, but it's true. I really wake up every morning with a really big sense of gratitude, um, just in a way that I hadn't before. So yeah. Timmy, why are you laughing? <laughs> I just saw Ora, OJ rolling her eyes. Like, no, I'm cut this knife I thought it was a lovely way to end the segment. It is, it's actually. Well done, the well. The presenter is like, oh, my gosh. Right. I'm just going to mute and then walk and, out the door. Bye. And, and just, just, just to say, uh, I've, been reading, I've, I've, been, I've been reading a book called The Little Book of Gratitude as well. So it's kind oh of like my it's god it, it's a good time to kind of like count your blessings right please because put the link below you could you could no, be my bus, do, yeah. you, you could be the bus driver who called me up who's been sent home right yeah, so true. you know and that's there true. are many other people in, in that situation so you know it's but, true yeah. I, I read a really interesting post well it's just a, a post about how social distancing is a real privilege that actually if you have a home that you can stay in with food with a family that's loving and so on then we're really lucky to be able to do so so as much as I rolled my eyes at Athea, Athea you're completely right I have been feeling very grateful during this period of time and I think another thing that I and I will try to do is to share some um like initiatives or things that you can do uh, to kind of make a positive impact during this time if you are one of the lucky ones and you're in recognition of that um so some charities or you know just anything that you might want to give some time or some money to during this period of time and on that note we do need to go and thank you so much guys for um tuning in whether you are listening live or listening back we are grateful Get in touch with us, follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, get in touch via LinkedIn, email us at manifestoread at gmail.com and let us know if you have any feedback or anything that you want to hear us discuss. And as always, subscribe, leave a comment, review us, keep listening. Thank you. Stay tuned for our next episode, our next episode next week, same time next week which will be kind of looking at the macro of what we've been talking about. So kind of looking at obviously the global economic response, the world response, the global economic response to this, um, climate change, all that lovely stuff. Um, Markets, what markets are responding to this. So stay tuned for that same time, same place next week on The Manifesto Read. And you'll be the lead host on that one. So we'll actually get to... Yeah, you actually get to hear me. Although I've been a lot of background (laughs) stuff in here recording this. So actually people get to listen to this. So I haven't been... I know, you're doing important work, Aya. You're doing important... I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for you. When I wake up in the morning, I'm really grateful for you. She's meant to be my podcast wife, but she's literally... I am! If anything, this banter that we're having right now is very reflective of marriage. So I think that we're doing well. Yeah, (laughs)
Okay, See you guys. I'm actually going to go now. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.